It's so important that we contextualize the language that we use so that our students can optimally learn. We've discussed before the language information structure that many students from low-income communities bring doesn't always match the load uh, of language information being presented in the classroom. So we need to present ideas first very concretely and then get to the abstract later. We need to provide extra contextualization with direct hands-on experience. Our students from low income communities may need more contextualized language and that can be done through direct hands-on learning, opportunities for real cooperative learning with peers, and opportunities for individual exploration. So the more opportunities we build into our lessons for students to really work with a partner, the more opportunities they'll get to hear and practice the contextualized learning language uh, needed for learning in your classroom. We do need to acknowledge that a, that a very difficult cycle can develop. So if the language of um, a student's current information system does not keep up with the language demands of the classroom, what happens is then that student may not be able to master the new school skills that you're presenting. And then they're consistently being asked to do things that they can't do. So a strategy for contextualizing language that you can implement yourself or share with other colleagues uh, follows the acronym VCR. So that's maybe a, a technology we don't see very often anymore, but that stands for volume, the amount of language we're going to use, content, thinking about the words you're using, and the rate at which you're delivering. You can also bring in visuals and props and just help students to really uh, make connections with what you're saying by contextualizing through props. To just give an analogy, we sometimes have to think of language experiences as a bank. Children from high income communities often have more linguistic money in the bank, if you will, that have been stored away from all these positive language experiences over time. However, when academic withdrawals are made, who has plenty available? It's those students who have had those deposits over time, right? But for our students from low income communities, if they have smaller linguistic reserves, if you will, when the language of the classroom makes these withdrawals, they often are left with a deficit. And when there's a deficit, they're not taking away the learning that you're trying to present. So how can we, as speech pathologists, as teachers, make more deposits into the minds of our kids from low-income communities? Some of the ways we can do that are to really engage children in natural conversation and dialogue rather than just talking at them. It's important that students can control the topic of the conversation. We also want to use informational talk and, and sort of pour words into their actions. So as we see them doing something in the classroom, we can uh, almost narrate uh, a piece of, of what they're doing and so that they can attach new vocabulary to the actions that they're already accomplishing. It's also important to respond in ways to promote continued talk. Can you say more about that? or? Does anyone have a, a counter argument for what was just stated? And get students to really engage in meaningful dialogue. The more we can provide opportunities for children to use language and interact during learning, the more they will benefit from being able to increasingly understand the language demands of your classroom. So our practice needs to be intentional with the goal of building the language information structure so that eventually our students, despite having perhaps come in with a different language information structure than the load of the classroom, eventually can be matched. The more we build language and content over time, the more we can actually use highly contextualized language to build both our students' language and the content simultaneously.